Okay. <laughs> okay. Steve Keller. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm excellent. How's yourself today, Paul? Hi, right, good. Did I pronounce your, I don't think so, your last name properly? Sure, it's a, yeah, it's the first name Steve, second name's Kill L.A. So to pronounce it properly, all you've got to do is think of Los Angeles and think of killing it. Kill L.A. Okay. <laughs> kill, but well, kill it. It's like Kill Bill from uh, <laughs> uh, a buddy of ours who was involved with water, actually. Uh, um, and uh, and I used to manage CBS out there in LA, in a way. Uh, so I've been a broadcaster a bit, and I saw, I'm saying that mainly only because you had sent me something on an email about future trends and about a perspective of, uh, I'll call it news, or you'll tell us more what you call it, um, that I really liked. And I liked oh, the way you, you presented it. I felt it was not, uh, we're a good news. So we like to say not beat up, uh, you know, upbeat, but not beat up. But it's important to know what's going on, but it's important to know what's going on in a, in a human way, <laughs> not in a horrible, mean way. And I felt you had that. Congratulations. Tell us about your media. Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you how Future Trends comes about. So I'm the chairman and executive, the director of the Institute for Economics and Peace. So we're the world's leading organization on metrics to measure peace, describe economic values to changes in peace, and then using statistical analysis to understand what is peace. Wow. And so we work with organizations like UN, World Bank, OECD, Commonwealth Sec Secretary of the EU. Now work's also taught in thousands of schools. But what we noticed with COVID-19, the news is swamped with COVID-19, but it's a paradigm changing event but you couldn't see through all the new all the news on COVID-19 to where the future was going so we thought what we'd do is bring out a punchy newsletter which we put out once a week which would then look at about the 15 to 20 news items of the week which give us some idea of where the future was heading and the idea was to try and produce them in a non-political way in as factual way as possible and then just to throw in one or two really interesting tidbits. Well, I'm, I'm, I put it up. I put up your first, your first, uh, the, the first one I received, and I want to continue because it helps to promote what you're doing. Because uh, with our audience, you know, the the good news about the internet and the web is that it's not like the old days. CBS, when I was there, was CBS. You wanted their stuff. You you gave them your firstborn and begged them to have your stuff. We want to share our content. It only builds a bigger audience and a bigger community and a bigger opportunity to hear the wonderful messages we're creating. Isn't that, isn't that so? Oh, yeah. No, I'd agree with it 100%. So one of, one, of, one of the really interesting things out of COVID-19 is we'd spend a lot of time traveling, talking at conferences all around the world. But since COVID-19, we're doing a whole lot of Zoom events now in seminars and webinars now what we've done in the last year i think we've done about 190 of them so it's a, it's a lot so we're doing a lot more than what we would have when we were traveling around the world talking at events but what's fascinating you're getting less people on the zoom than what you would when you're at an event but a lot of the time it goes up onto facebook or on to other channels now we're finding you're getting something like 10 to 20 times the number of people looking at it looking at it once it's put up online so our actual audience numbers have really grown and i think we did have 22,000 people directly on zoom links last year but you'd multiply that by another 10 to 20 for the number of people who've watched it afterwards well i learned early on so i, I you know i had a broadcasting career so you know we sent it out and uh, that was that pretty much so a repeat was like summertime the only time you do repeats with the, with the internet, actually I learned, someone told me early on, I'm doing 22 years on the web, that uh, what people, it takes three weeks almost before you're gonna get your audience for that, uh, uh, that story, on demand, let's call it, on demand yeah. story. And uh, uh, so we need to, it, it's a good, good thing. It takes some patience and they can see it, they can see it again and all these little, you could share with your friends, you could share with your community. 
those are all just, I mean, the television doesn't have that. You can't push the television and send the CBS message to somebody else. You know, it's the, it is what it is. Yeah, that's great. See, well, congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. Well, you're doing good things. That, that's why. What else, how do you see the future for your future trends? <laughs> What's your future? <laughs> well, it gets, at this point, it gets difficult. So COVID-19 set up a whole series of the, uh, 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 how can I put it? Well, here's the word events, which will cascade into the future. So number of, some, some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Well, what we've seen with COVID-19 is that we've had more money invested in a vaccine than ever before in history. There's something like $71 billion have been put into the investment of looking for a vaccine over the last uh, uh, six months. So this is truly staggering. If we go back and we look at the uh, uh, other vaccines which have come onto the market, they take generally over a decade to get there. And that's just because of the trials you've got to go through. We're seeing this one getting fast track. So what that may mean is there will be a lot faster mechanisms in the future for other drugs to come on the market. This is, a, this, this is a trendsetter. But also what we can see is that governments now are putting huge amounts of money into stimulating their economies. Now, as we start to look at this amount of money going into it, this is creating huge levels of debt, or as in the States, using a, a quantitative easing to print more money. Now, the long-term effects of that, we don't know. We don't know. But as you flood more money into the market, it makes the cost of money cheaper. So if you're looking at, let's say, the cost of the 30-day uh, bank bills, let's say in Australia, and it'd be very similar in the US, it's 0.1%. Money is very, very cheap. Now, we can see with the stock markets, the stock markets are actually holding up and booming if we look at it over the last six months, and that's part of it, is the offshoot of all this money being pumped into society. But on the other hand, what we're finding, that unemployment is rising rapidly. We've also, we look at it, we've also got the economies which aren't going to bounce back anytime soon. So you've got this, how can I put it? A, 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 yeah, this dialectic where on the one hand, you've got to, uh, those with a lot of money, their assets are improving and going through the roof. But at the other end, the people, let's say the lower half of society, they're struggling more and more. And this is going to lead to more social tension as we move forward over the next five years. So tell me about you, because I feel like I'm talking to Kenneth Galbraith. Um, <laughs> I <and> wish. <laughs> So, so tell us about you. Give me a little background on, on, on yeah, yourself. Now look, yeah, now my background's in business, actually. I set up a couple of international IT companies. First one was publicly listed on NASDAQ. Second on the Australian Stock Exchange. Uh, now, out of that, I made quite a bit of money. And so I got involved in developmental aid probably about oh, 25 years ago. And the aim was to, the, the foundations, to work with the poorest of the poor. So that was really took me into a lot of overseas aid. So I ended up a lot of time in war zones, near post war zones. Then I was in Northeast Kabul in the Congo one time, walking through there and thought, well, what are the most peaceful nations in the world? And was there anything I could learn from them? Searched the internet, couldn't find anything. And so from that, I thought, well, that's worth doing. So developed the Global Peace Index, which is today is the world's leading measure of global peacefulness. It's used by all the organisations I mentioned earlier on, uh, taught in thousands, of, used in thousands of university courses. From that, I established an institute called the Institute for Economics and Peace, and that's where I spend most of my time today, Paul. All right, well, I love that. Now, I, I, you, you might not know something about uh, me, I'm just gonna say that, because I've used your index, and I've used your index because I've been involved with the International Day of Peace since 2002. So right. Creating a concert. I don't know if I sent that when I was saying let's talk, but uh, we have had a concert in Central Park um, and I've taken over Times Square for the last six years um, and uh, promoting and trying to strengthen our best, uh, we're calling it a peace day party, uh, the message of the, uh, of the United Nations where 193 countries raised their hand and we want those hands to actually mean something more than raising their hands. 
we're yeah. from the belief of the good news. So we're, we're from the belief that the world, in my mind, you, you can statistically, and we like statistics, actually, we, where we've done research in multicultural communities and are kind of well known for that too. So I like research. It's like doing the laundry. You put it in and you come out with something, you decide yeah. if something, whether it smells good or not, that's the question. You can worry about that right after. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, I speak on, and I, I sort of thought your, your research might say, I'm a believer the world's at peace. I believe that there's a, a few people, whatever it is, 8 billion people. So I use 10%. When I did Woodstock, Richie Haven said to me, 10%, so 800 million are confused, they'll punch you in the nose, they'll shoot you, they'll steal from you. But the most of the world is a peaceful world. And uh, what is your, being a professional uh, researcher in this area, and, uh, and, and more importantly, passionate uh, about this area, um, what's your thought? Or what's your research say? Well, I think it's, well, to paint this, this is a beautiful thing of research. It gives you the ability, and you've got a whole lot of stats. You can come in at it from multiple angles. So let's look at the last decade. If we look back over the last decade, the world actually became less peaceful. So it decreased by 2.5%. Now, that may, doesn't mean much to anyone. But it was 81 countries decreased and 79 nine countries improved. So as you can see, peace over that decade is finally balanced. Eight of the 11 years, it deteriorated. But now, if we look at it and go into it a little bit more deeper, and we look at the wars in the Middle East, like the uh, Iraq War, Syrian War, Afghanistan, if you move them out, then the world would have actually become more peaceful in that decade than over that period of time. We also find that if you go to the top end of the index, the most peaceful countries are becoming more peaceful. Yet you go to the bottom end of the index and the least peaceful countries are becoming less peaceful. We call that the global inequality in peace. And so the emphasis can be on fixing the problematic countries. And this is where, in a lot of ways, the West gets involved, starts wars, but then we don't know how to solve them. We can't solve them. We could have solved those wars. The world actually would have been, become more peaceful over time. Now. We look at things like terrorism, so it's something on everyone's mind, but that peaked in 2014 with about 36,000 deaths. In 2019, we're down to about 12,000 deaths. And if we look at the same period, battlefield deaths peaked at just over 100,000, and are now down to 55,000. So, so there are some positive trends over the last five years. But one of the more fascinating trends, which nobody actually realises that if we look at militarisation, that's actually improved over the last decade. So 60% of the countries which we follow in the index have actually decreased the percentage of GDP spent on the military. So that's 100 countries. And also we've got 112 countries which have decreased the number of troops which they have as well. So in some ways, there are a number of positive trends out there. And again, just shows with the data, you need to be, it gives you the ability to look at something from many different lenses. Because quite often, when, you, when we talk about war and peace, it's a narrative. And that can only ever be one lens. So, you know, as you know, and as you can see here, now we need to do some marketing. We need to take that message. And why, why can't we get that message on the front page of the uh, XYZ newspaper and the uh, and that XYZ network, you know, this is my 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 mortgage. <laughs> my life <laughs> is to uh, uh, take the good message. You've had a lot of good news in what you just said, okay? But do do we see that good news, or do we only see the shots that are happening in the Middle East? Or do we, what's the problem there? Why won't the people say that we are getting better? I can't. I cannot remember the Harvard professor who's actually a whole chapter of my book that I wrote, uh, talking about that man wasn't created to uh, uh, to fight war, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Why can't we get the media to promote goodness and peacefulness? Well, 
I think it's a little bit more complex. So we get we last year we ended up with twenty billion media impressions of the products we've got. Okay. Oh, okay. So right. and so in that we always make sure we do focus on the uh, what we perceive as good. But the media does have a tendency to pick up on the negative, and the reason for that is most people are motivated by uh, uh, more their immediate emotions and a lot of the time the more immediate emotions are our fear and our anxiety so the media plays to that because you know very very well the media is really about the number of eyeballs they can get because that drives their advertising so what we found is one of the ways of being able to promote peace and the global peace index could have been called global violence index but we called it the global peace index because we want to get the fa- emphasis on peace and emphasis on the countries which are doing well so lead tables people always love them so if you put out the global peace index people are interested in the countries which are the top which naturally start to bring to people's minds why Okay, this is what we'll do, because I, I, I know you're on a tight schedule, okay? And I, I respect that. And what I'd like to do, because I'm going to ask you one more question, and, uh, which I ask thousands of people, actually. Um, and I'd like to invite you back and have a, a part two or three or four with you, because you're a smart man, and you're doing great work to help society. To be, now, I didn't actually know that you do that, uh, the peace index. Uh, I was just enamored with you with the future trends. So, so thank you. And, and this is the question. You'll like my question. Okay, so because we do the peace uh, 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 outreach, I've asked many people, what does peace mean to them? If you could say your name, what does peace mean to you? Well, peace means to me, it depends on the lens I put on. Okay, so it hasn't got any one meaning. So for me, the first thing it starts with is the, uh, the absence of afflictive emotion. That's a personal piece. The second piece is what I would describe as positive piece. And that's the attitudes, institutions, structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. But if you went and had a look in Sanskrit, there are 108 words for love. If you went to the Japanese, they've got 14 words to describe beauty. We've only got one word to describe peace, but there are many, many different types of peace. I've just hit on two. And Socrates once said, if you haven't got a word to describe something, how can you think about it? We're gonna do part 150 with you. Uh, (laughs) You're a great man. Thank you so much and I, 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 uh, I look forward to a long, long, long term relationship with you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.